You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Uh, Eddie Arnold, Charles Boyer, Joe Bushkin, Mindy Carson, Imogene Coker, Jimmy Durante, Clifton Webb, <laughs> Meredith Wilson, and my name, darlings, is Tulu Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. Star is in America, the curtains of America. We're going to fill your parlor full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at the same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, this has been a most hectic week. I've been engaged to do a series of lectures all over the country... And I've only just returned from my first engagement at Southern Methodist University, deep in the heart of Texas. Oh, and what a reception I received from those friendly, enthusiastic audiences down there, deep in the heart of Texas. Oh, they're wonderful people. They're almost like us up here in the United States. <laughs> and I'm so looking forward to going back very soon way down there. Deep in the heart of Texas <laughs> What's going on back there? Oh, so if you'll pardon me, darlings I'd like to say a friendly hello To all the friends I made down there <laughs> Deep in the heart of Texas <laughs> <laughs> Yankee musicians <laughs> Well, so much for small talk And on with the big show And a very special and dear friend Makes his appearance here today Clifton Webb, whom I've known for a long, long time. About 67 years. <laughs> what is that? I told them about six or seven years. <laughs> Yankee writers. Incredible. The great Tallulah reduced to radio. Clifton Webb. Darling, I received your frantic cable in London, and I took the first plane back. How was the trip, Clifton? Swift. I had breakfast in London, lost it over Newfoundland, <laughs> and arrived in New York that night. When I got your cry for help, I thought you were broke. I thought you were ill. I thought you were dying. These I wouldn't mind, but Tallulah Bank had on radio. Huh. What would Sarah Bernard say? Eleonora Dooza. I don't see that old crowd anymore, darling. <laughs> I'm in radio. Uh, this is my new medium. And couldn't your new medium put you in touch with that old crowd? <laughs> <laughs> but Clifton, this is a new crowd. They're big names in radio. Haven't you ever heard of Fibber McGee and Molly? Fibber McGee and Molly? And you put yourself in the same class with those three? <laughs> No, Clifton. Fibber McGee and Molly are only two. Uh, two, indeed. Uh, you're forgetting, Tallulah, I wrote the song, Just Molly and Me and Baby Makes Three. <laughs> the baby's name was Fibber. <laughs> well, obviously, darling, you don't know very much about radio. You should become more familiar with it. I already have the contempt for it, which familiarity usually breeds. Well, how can you talk about radio that way, Clifton? Do you realize that every Sunday I can reach 20 million people? How fortunate for you it's not the reverse. <laughs> I promise you, Tulu, had I known that you were having to descend to this, I would never have invented radio. You invented radio? <laughs> Don't play the startled fawn, dear. Surely you've heard of the network web on radio stations? <laughs> Mr. Belvedere, you're beginning to take your movie role seriously. Oh, and how is your old crowd in the movies, Abbott and Costello? Um, Sabu, the elephant boy. 
Francis the Mule. And uh, Betty, what's her name? Hutton. Surely, Tanu, you're not mentioning motion pictures in the same breath with radio. Don't talk to me about radio. I've seen those popcorn classics in which you appear. Clifton, really, a babysitter. And that other picture, cheaper by the dozen. You, a father of 12 children. <laughs> oh, darling. 12 children. <laughs> mm. I find myself suddenly bored. I think I'll go to my club. Obviously, the stock club. <laughs> Obviously, darling, Noel Coward is not writing your material these days. When I think of your starring in those smart, sophisticated comedies Noel wrote for you... Ah, oh, dear Noel. Did you see him in London, darling? Yes, I telephoned him there this afternoon. He asked about you. Oh, Noel. Did you tell him I was on this radio program? I wouldn't dare. I told him you were on relief. <laughs> He'll be happier that way. Oh, oh, happy, happy, Noel. I just mentioned his name the other night during one of my lectures. Oh, I didn't tell you, darling. I'm lecturing now, you know, all over the country. And what patent medicine are you selling? <laughs> Clifton, how dare you? Doesn't it get cold this time of year on the back of those wagons? <laughs> uh, darling, <laughs> I'm lecturing on the theatre. In fact, I've just returned from a triumphant engagement way down there... A deep in the heart of Texas. That's a quaint arrangement. Is this the clack that you travel with? Huh? Look here, you baby burping boy. Ah, now, no, that's more like it. <laughs> this is the Tallulah I've known and loved for so many years. <laughs> but tell me, why have you sunk to this? What does it get you? Money. <laughs> but why, Tallulah? How much money can you keep? How much have you got left after the government takes out the... <laughs> taxes? <laughs> That clack of yours can't even spell. <laughs> Meredith Wilson, can't those performing seals of yours do anything besides beat their fins? Come here, Meredith, darling. Yes, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> darling, haven't you some music prepared for this program? Oh, sure. Uh, we were going to play You Go to My Head. Oh, good, darling. Oh, Meredith, this is, uh, this is Clifton Webb. Oh, gee, how do you do, Mr. Webb? I'm a big fan of yours. Why, uh, I used to see all your pictures back in Mason City, Iowa. That's my hometown, you know. But uh, I don't suppose you ever heard of Mason City, Iowa. Mason City, Iowa. Population 27,080. It's the county seat of Cerro Gordo County, situated 100 miles from Des Moines, and the mayor is a Mr. H. E. Bruce, whose term expires in April 1951, and I should be there to help re-elect him. <laughs> well, gee, that sounds like an exciting town, the way you tell it, Mr. Webb. Tell you, who is this oaf? <laughs> now, Clifton, please, Meredith is one of the most accomplished musicians. He is not an oaf. He seems only half there. Well, half an oaf is better than none. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Meredith Wilson, his big show orchestra and chorus, in one of Meredith's famous chiffon arrangements, the thrilling, You Go to My Head.
see that it never can be. My soul with your eyes Though I'm certain That this heart of mine Has a ghost goes a chance In this crazy romance You go to my head You go to my head If that was divine, darling. Uh, Tallulah, since you insist on making a public display of yourself here, I've come to the conclusion that as your oldest and dearest friend, I should uh, come to your rescue. Now, the two of us could hold this hour and a half melange together very nicely. I have great plans for you. Darling, I have great news for you. It may come as a shock, but there are other stars on this show. Jimmy Durante, for one. James Durante with Tallulah Bankhead, the nose and the throat. <laughs> now, dear, we can do very nicely without him. Oh, no, you can't. Everyone around here has a clack. Well, you can't have a show without Durante. We don't care what anybody claims. Oh, you can't have a show without Durante. Even if Tallulah was to do the hula hula. Oh, you can't have a show without Durante. I hear someone mention my name? <laughs> Everybody wants Durante. Too bad I ain't twins. We could share the same nose. <laughs> Listen, you know the famous Schnazola. The Schnazola, population <laughs> 33,880. <laughs> uh, 2,200 feet above sea level. Clifton, uh, please, uh, please. Jimmy, you know Clifton, don't you, darling? Oh, Clifton. Uh, how are you, Mr. Fadiman? <laughs> Boy, am I glad to meet you. You know, I sent some questions into that program of yours. Long distance, please. Jimmy, you're wrong. You're thinking of information, please. Again, I've got the wrong number. <laughs> All right, information, please. I sent some questions in and they answered every one of them. Even that tough one about who was the first president of the United States. <laughs> one of them guys made a lucky guess and was I mortified. Why was I mortified? I wanted one of them encyclopedias. But no, who gets the encyclopedias? The smart guys who stump the exploits. They don't need the encyclopedias. They know all the answers. But bums like me that don't know the answers, we don't get no encyclopedias. Would you mind repeating that question? <laughs> How do you like that? I finally stumped the expert. You don't even know the question. Jimmy, darling, I ought to tell you, this is uh, not... Please, Tallulah, uh, please, please let me... Uh, Mr. Durante, I am not Clifton Fadiman. As you so aptly put it yourself, again, you have the wrong number. Uh, surely at some time in your haggard existence, <laughs> you must have stumbled into a cinema and seen me on the screen in a very fine motion picture in which I gave a superb performance as the father of 12 children. Your Papa Dion? <laughs> Sorry, wrong number. Don't tell me you're Barbara Stanwyck. 
Young man, and I use the term loosely, I'll try once more. In my latest motion picture, 20th Century Foxes for Heaven's Sake, I play the part of an angel who comes to Earth as a cowboy. Oh, yeah, I've seen that picture. You couldn't possibly. It hasn't been released yet. <laughs> well, maybe. I lost my place. Right? <laughs> it hasn't been released yet. <laughs> well, maybe if it's a good little picture, maybe if it... I haven't found it yet. <laughs> You couldn't possibly. It hasn't been released yet. Well, maybe if it's a good little picture, it will get out on parole. <laughs> Had enough, Clifton? Not quite. No, not quite. <laughs> now I'll tear him to shreds to match those clothes he's wearing. <laughs> What's the matter with these clothes? Have you ever considered having your suits custom made? How can I? I got a ready-made body. <laughs> the man who sold you that suit should be hanged and quartered. That's right, hanged and quartered. It was hanging on the rack, then it was a quarter off. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a million of them. <laughs> That's not in the script, Jimmy. Besides, I picked it out myself. You can't hold this suit against my tailor. The way it fits you, you have a suit against your tailor. <laughs> How do you like this guy? Who heads the list of the ten best-dressed men in the country? I am the list. Well, move over. <laughs> well, move over and meet the new champ. I just came off to Queen Mary just today. I feel spry and gay. Say, now all the interviewers down at the dock, they tried to interview me. And all the photographers, they tried to click me. They wanted me to pose for cheesecake. But I couldn't get any, so I posed with Strudel. Elsie Strudel. <laughs> A shuffleboard companion. <laughs> I said, no, folks, you don't pass the situation. Say, I'm Jimmy, that well-dressed man. An international sort of dapper dad. On Sunday afternoon, I can't resist the urge to walk down the boulevard in my shiny blue surge. Just feel this nifty piece of gabardine. It's the finest piece of goods you ever seen. Now, I hope you don't think that this suit is all that I own. Why, it's ridiculous. Why, I spend $3,000 a year on mott balls alone. <laughs> yes, I'm Jimmy, that well-dressed man. Now, deny that if you can. I only the other day, I went to my tailor, and I ordered a shot true. Them writers think they're writing for Clifton Webb. <laughs> The other day I went to my tailor and ordered a purple coat <laughs> With reversible shoulders A lavender chapeau With a peacock feather And a mink vest Live mink But instead of a walking stick I bought myself a baseball bat Because if I ever pass a pool room in that outfit I'll be ready <laughs> Yes, I'm Jimmy, that well-dressed man I set the styles for the social plan Till I showed Ronald Coleman how to dress to kill. He didn't even know his worsted from his English twill. You know, I'll never forget walking into the theater this morning, wearing a new pair of Sears and Roebuck slacks. And what happened? The first time I bent over, Sears and Roebuck dissolved partnership. <laughs> Say now I'm Jimmy that well dressed man. Now deny that if you can. Yes, deny that. The great Durante. Thank you, Tanu. <laughs> How about your friend there? What does he think? Oddly enough, I liked it. I can't think why. There's an appalling lack of technique, 
The diction is cluttered, the attack inconsistent, the quality brash and lacking in delicacy, and still, oddly enough, <laughs> it intrigued me. <laughs> Thank you. I think. <laughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. Which one of you is Miss Bankhead? <laughs> Emma Jean Coco. I'm, I'm Tallulah Bankhead, darling. And gentlemen, I want you to meet one of television's brightest stars, Emma Jean Coco. Mr. Webb, Mr. Durante. How do you do, Mr. Webb? Just a minute. He's Webb. How could you ever have confused us? Well, to tell you the truth, that's why I came over here tonight. Why, Emma Jean? Because all of us at home sit around and listen to your show on the radio, particularly my mother. We listen every Sunday. We hear what's going on, but we just can't see it. I just can't see it either, and I'm right here. <laughs> well, that's the way we feel at home. So I promised my mother, she's sitting at home now listening, I promised her I'd kind of describe what's going on. So you people go right ahead and do whatever you're doing, and I'll try to explain it to my mother. I won't be in your way, will I? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, let's get on with the show. Where were we, darling? What were we saying? I was talking to Mr. Fatterman here when it... <laughs> you put the comma in the wrong place. You'll have to excuse me. <laughs> I was talking to Mr. Fatterman here when in she comes and she says her mother wants to see the show on their radio. You can't do that. That's television without... Television. It's bad enough to have television without entertainment, but television without television, that's double jalopy. <laughs> I hope I'm not misquoted. See you later, Chilu. <laughs> Ma, you listening? About Miss Bankhead's dress, I'll describe it to you. Remember the dress we saw at Macy's? <laughs> the one for $14.95? And they wanted extra for the alterations because you thought it was too tight? Well, this is an expensive copy of that one. And she didn't have the alterations. She doesn't care how tight it is. <laughs> you know the one I mean? The blue one. Well, think of the blue one and take off the peplum and the lace collar, lower on top and longer on the bottom. That's her dress in yellow. Matilda, <laughs> do you just stand here and let this television actress take over the show? Is that the usual procedure? Ma, about Clifton Webb. He's wearing white gloves with blue stripes. I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Ma. Those are his hands with blue veins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ma, you were wrong. She's got all of her teeth. <laughs> you keep that up, darling, and nobody will be able to say that about you. <laughs> When you see these people in person, you get a much better picture. No white lines going through them. And everybody has only one face, not three. You see, Miss Bankhead, we watch television all the time. My mother and I watched the baseball games all last summer. The Johns, I hope. Oh, no. We went to the Yankee Stadium. Uh, those darn Yankees again. And were we surprised to see that Joe DiMaggio's number was five? Not 555. <laughs> oh, Ma, here comes a very pretty girl. I don't know who she is, but she just smiled at me. Why, it's Mindy Carson. <laughs> Mindy, come here, darling. I want you to meet Clifton Webb. How do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mr. Webb? I've looked forward to seeing you in person. Thank you. And if I'd have known what you looked like, I'd have looked forward to seeing you in person. Ma, they're not even looking at each other. They're looking at their scripts. <laughs> how about a song, Mindy? Oh, may I? Oh, of course, darling. Meredith, how about some music for Mindy, huh? Why, sure. Uh, what would you like to sing? Do you have Bushel and a Peck, Meredith? Oh, I think we can find it. Ma, he's been ready to play it for five minutes. <laughs> One more crack out of you, darling, and I'll send you back to Caesar. And I mean Julius. <laughs> Mindy, darling, would you please sing, huh? I love you A bushel and a peck A bushel and a peck And a hug around the neck 
hug around the neck and a barrel in the heap, barrel and a heap, and I'm talking in my sleep about you. About you. About you. Talking all about you. Can't live without you. Cause I love you, a bushel and a peck. You bet your pretty neck I do. Do, 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 do. Listen, Mindy Carson, we're gonna get a parson. Can't say a mind if you do. Cause I love you, a bushel and a peck. A bushel and a peck, though you make my heart a wreck. Make my heart a wreck, and you make my life a mess. You say we make your life a mess. Yes, a mess of happiness about you. About you. Love you a bushel and a peck. You bet your pretty neck I do. Do do Hey Mindy, what you doing on the farm? What you doing with the basket on your arm? Well, I love you a bushel and a peck. A bushel and a peck, yeah, and it beats me all the heck, beats me all the heck, how I'll ever tend the farm, ever tend the farm, when I want to keep my arm about you, about you, about you, cuter than the dickens, say the cows and chickens, cause I love you, a bushel and a peck, you bet your pretty neck I do. Cause I love you A bushel and a peck And you bet your pretty neck I do I do and they applaud. Emma Jean, will you please stop that? Cliff, and how'd you like Mindy? Not bad at all. Form good, movement excellent. In fact, one of the finest voices I've ever seen. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Webb. And would you do me a favor? Would you give me your autograph on this piece of paper? Uh, certainly, my child. In which language? <laughs> language? Arabic, Hindustani, Greek, or just plain old, everyday, ancient Phoenician? Well, I'd like it in plain old American, please. How gauche. Very well. Here you are. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Webb. Ma, wait till she gets home and finds out she hasn't got Clifton Webb's autograph at all. It's the sound man. <laughs> wait a minute. Stop the penmanship. Don't you want my autograph? Oh, but Mr. Durante, I already have your John Hancock. Maybe from John Hancock, but not from me. Well, I'd better break this up right here and ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that combines wildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By the makers of Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by your local Ford dealer, who is now displaying the new 1951 Ford, the car that's built for the years ahead. The big stars on this program are Eddie Arnold, Joe Bushkin, Charles Boyer, Mindy Carson, Imogene Coca, Jimmy Durante, 
Clifton Webb, Meredith Wilson, and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. And every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darling, we've been having a difficult time trying to keep the big show intact this week. That's because there are so many diverse temperaments to deal with. Now, first, there's my friend Clifton Webb, the talented stage and motion picture star. He resents my being on radio entirely. I resent her being on radio entirely. He thinks I'm debasing myself by being on radio. I think she's debasing herself by being on radio. Clifton's getting a little too old to accept new ideas. I think she's debasing herself by being on radio. (laughs) And then I'm having a little difficulty with Imogene Coco. Now, she's a television star. She's been listening to our show on radio with her mother. Her mother misses being able to see the performance as well as hear it. My mother misses being able to see the performance as well as hear it. So Imogene is describing to her mother whatever is happening on stage. So I'm describing to my mother whatever is happening on stage. I have a feeling she's quite impressed with us. (laughs) Ma, that's not in the script. She's (laughs) ad-libbing. And then we have uh, Jimmy Durante with us. He's a little confused about one of our guest stars. I'm a little confused about one of the guest stars. He has Clifton Webb mixed up with Clifton Fadiman. I have Clifton Webb mixed up with Clifton Finnegan. Well, as a result, Jimmy has become psychoneurotic, hypersensitive, and psychologically unstable. As a result, I have become, here we go, psychoneurotic, hypersensitive, and, fi- and, and psychologically, I belong in a stable. And then, of course, of course, I've been waiting to introduce one of my very favorite people, the world-famous stage and motion picture star. His name is Charles Boyer. Okay. He's a dear friend. Je suis un cher ami. Charles, uh, je t'adore. Why should I shut the door? I did not open it. <laughs> Ma, believe me, this man knows what just adore means. Charles, darling, you know Clifton Webb, don't you? Oh, of course. Hello, Clifton. How are you? As well as can be expected under these miserable circumstances. <laughs> Tell me, Charles, how are things in Paris? Ah, oh, Tallulah, Paris has such wonderful memories. But you know, I've been living in Hollywood for many years, and no one asks me about Hollywood. The only question they ever ask me is, how are things in Paris? Well, Charles, there's so many more interesting things in Paris. As there are also in this country. But, darling, in Paris you have such gay boulevards. Well, here we have Sixth Avenue. You have those colorful, fiery, tempestuous apaches. Here we have the Brooklyn Dodger fans. Oh, dear, my poor Johns. And those wonderful, romantic Frenchmen who flake with you as you stroll along the sidewalks of Paris. I told you, here we have Sixth Avenue. And you had the Folie Berger. Ah, but here we have Fifth Avenue on a windy day. <laughs> and those little old ladies gossiping about their shopping at the marketplace. And here we have Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, two little old men who also like to gossip. Here we go. Where you been, genius? In some corner drugstore getting your kicks at the comic book counter? No, no, I was at the prescription counter admiring your picture on the iodine bottle. (laughs) There's a delightful picture of you on the Lydia Pinkham bottle, too. Seriously, friends, Skin Flint and I, we do agree 100% on this. Chesterfield is the cigarette that everybody ought to be smoking. Right, and they will, Bob, when they find out how easy it is to prove that Chesterfields are milder. Sure, it's the easiest test in the book. Just get a hold of a pack of Chesterfields, then open them, smell them, and smoke them. Compare them with the cigarettes you've been smoking, and you'll find that Chesterfields do smell milder, and they smoke mild, too. Chesterfield, Chesterfield, always wins first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. This Christmas, give Chesterfield Christmas cartons with Bing Crosby as Papa Santa Claus. Ladies and gentlemen, one of America's most popular folk singers whose records have sold in the millions, 14 million to be exact, And here he is, with bank book to match, Eddie Arnold. (laughs) Welcome to the big show, Eddie, and I want you to meet Clifton Webb. Hi, y'all, Mr. Webb. We're all splendid. (laughs) 
Clifton. Eddie is one of our great folk singers, a southern folk singer. You come from Tennessee, don't you, Eddie? I do, and uh, you come from Alabama, don't you, ma'am? I do, sir. I now pronounce you Mason and Dixon. <laughs> Clifton, we must draw the line somewhere. I want you to be nice to Eddie Arnold. He's come all the way up here from Nashville to be on our show. Mr. Webb's probably never heard of Nashville, Tennessee. You'll be sorry you gave him that straight line. <laughs> Tennessee, one of the 48 states. Population, 2,915,841. Tennessee is bounded on the west by Arkansas, on the north by Kentucky, on the east by North Carolina, and on the south by Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. As you can see, it's practically in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> How dare you, Clifton? Sir, you have insulted a flower of the Southland, and I'm forced to thrash you within an inch of your life. How cliche can you get? <laughs> Sir, defend yourself. I intend to beat you to a pulp. Don't you dare touch me. Well, if you won't defend yourself, sir, I'm going to play my guitar and sing. Well, if that's my choice, beat me to a pulp. <laughs> Daddy, darling, never mind that Yankee. He's still angry because the North lost the war. <laughs> What are you going to sing for us, darling? A lovely little thing, the love bug itch. Uh. When the love bug bites, you don't know where to scratch. It keeps right on a biting, then it begins to hatch. It makes the old feel young and the poor feel rich. It's just a little thing that's called the love bug itch. Oh, the day I held my baby on my knee along came the love bug and took a bite of me i put my arms round her tied a lover's hitch i tingled and i knew i had the love bug itch oh i love her lips i love them close to mine i love them cause they taste like a drop of cherry wine i'm gonna stick to her just as if she's glue I'm itching for her, I know she's itching too. Oh, my pulse beats fast, my fever starts to rise. My heart goes pity pat when I look into her eyes. I break out in a sweat, then I begin to twitch. There ain't no vaccination for the love bug is. When the love bug bites, you don't know where to scratch. It keeps right on a biting, then it begins to hatch. It makes the old feel young and the poor feel rich. It's just a little thing that's called the love bug itch. Thank you, Eddie, darling. We'll be seeing you later on in the show. You know, darlings, in many ways and little things, the times we're living through now are quite like the restless hours and uncertain times in which F. Scott Fitzgerald's fascinating people live their glittering moment. Charles Boyer joins me now in retelling here on the big show one of Scott Fitzgerald's most poignant stories from his work, All the Sad Young Men. Here is The Adjuster. My mission is to heal those who are hurt But my treatment takes time I do the best I can, but I promise nothing, nothing at all I remember well a whole generation I had as a patient it was called the Twenties. You remember the Twenties? They lived and they were already damned. They danced and they drank and they played as if yesterday had never been, as if tomorrow were a lie. There was a sweet sadness in the air an ineffable sadness that belongs somehow to the young, 
You heard it in the tea time music at the rates of 1920. Heard it in the gossip of irresponsible young women like Luella Hempel. No, no, Edie. I do love my husband. Well, I hope I haven't given you that impression with all this talk. I, well, look, I, as a matter of fact, I cried myself to sleep last night. Because I know we're drifting slowly but surely to divorce. What? Well, why, most of the time we, we eat in restaurants, hotels, speakeasies. You know, Edie, I'm not going to be tied down to housekeeping. Of course, John hates it. <laughs> in fact, he hates everything I like. Well, that's just too bad. I sat home long enough while the baby was on the way, while I was nursing him. But now I'm, I'm sorry for John, Edie, but I'd rather he be unhappy than me. No, 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 darling, you mustn't pay the check, Edie. I've got the money right here. Oh, goodness, it's late. Oh, dear, we've got to run. Have you already sat in judgment upon Luella Hempel? Do not, I beg of you, do not be hasty. Remember, you must give her time. Yet, I promise nothing, nothing at all. Is that you, Luella? Yes, John. Sorry to be late. I've brought someone home to dinner. This is, this is Dr. Moon. This is my wife. Well, good evening, Mrs. Hempel. I hope I'm not interfering with any arrangement of yours. Oh, not at all. I'm, I'm delighted you're coming to dinner. We're quite alone. Such a nice house, Mrs. Hempel. And let me congratulate you on your fine little boy. Oh, thank you, Dr. Moon. Uh, do you specialize in children? Oh, I'm not a specialist at all. I'm about the last of my kind, a general practitioner. The last in New York, anyhow. In fact, Luella... John, stop rubbing your face. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Luella. As I was saying, I invited Dr. Moon here tonight because I... I wanted him to have a, a talk with you. Talk with me? Well, Dr. Moon's an old friend of mine, and I... I think he can tell you a few things, Luella, that... that you ought to know. Oh, well, I, I don't see exactly what you mean. There's nothing the matter with me. I don't feel... Believe I've ever felt better in my life. Well, excuse me. I, I have a letter to write. I... I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Moon. Obviously, my husband is not himself tonight. Well, he has told me a great deal about your unsatisfactory life together. He wonders if I can be of any help in smoothing things out. Well, I can't imagine what John has told you, Dr. Moon, but I'd much prefer to discuss something else. Oh, don't be afraid, Mrs. Hempel. Oh, I'm not in the least afraid of you, Dr. Moon. Tell me about your trouble. I'll do no such... Didn't you see him rubbing his face? Are you blind? He's becoming so irritating to me that I think I'll go mad. I see him. No, no, you don't see him. Don't you see I've had enough of home? Don't you see how bored I am with keeping house, with the baby, everything? I want excitement. And I don't care what form it takes or what I pay for it as long as it makes my heart beat. I see him. You don't see. Oh, I've tried to be good. and I'm, I'm not going to try anymore. If I'm one of those women who wrecked their lives for nothing, then I'll do it now. You can call me selfish, silly, anything you like, and be quite right. But in five minutes, I'm going out of this house and begin to be alive. Well, what are you listening to? Why don't you say something? You're not going out. I'm sure you're not going out. I am going out. You see, Mrs. Hempel, your husband is not well. He's been trying to live your kind of life, and the strain has been too much for him. He does things like rubbing his face or... Mrs. Hempel, can I speak to you privately? Oh, it's Mr. Hempel. He came into the kitchen and began throwing the food out of the icebox. Oh, it's horrible. He smashed things. Now he's crying and laughing, so it tears your heart out. Oh, it's horrible. A sudden shock can seem to last an eternity. Moments later... It is only a neon. Hours later, an era. Months later, an hour. It was so in the case of Luella Hempel. Mrs. Hempel, you seem well. I am well, Dr. Moon. Thank you. I congratulate you on the way you've taken hold of things. But I haven't taken hold of things at all. I did what I have to do. That's just it. But the house isn't going. I had to discharge the servants. All but the nurse who doesn't know her business. The baby's sick, and everything just as messy and terrible as it can be. Well, would you mind telling me how you found out that the nurse doesn't know her business? You find out various unpleasant things when you're forced to stay around a house, when you have to cook, clean, take care of a sick baby, tend to an invalid husband. You've made progress, but I feel somewhat discouraged. As I told you, I 
Promise nothing. I only do the best I can. What do you mean? You've done nothing for me. Nothing at all. Nothing yet, Mrs. Hample. It takes time. Oh, I've met your type before. For some reason, you think that you have a standing here as an old friend of the family. But I don't make friends quickly. And I haven't given you the privilege of being so, so personal with me. Now, if you'll excuse me, Dr. Moon, I have work to do. Mrs. Hempel! Mrs. Hempel, please, come quickly. Nurse, what is it? What's the matter? What's happened? Oh, no, not my baby. Not my baby! Months look in the mirror and find themselves years. Yet somehow the heart is heedless of time. The heart is reluctant to yield. I needed patience with Mrs. Hempel. Mrs. Hempel. You go away. Your husband needs you. I don't care. You haven't anyone now but him. I hate you. If you like, I promised nothing, you know. I do the best I can. You'll be better when you realize that your baby is dead. That he has been dead for a long time. You lie. You always lie. All right, my baby is dead. What shall I do now? Your husband is much better. All he needs now is rest and kindness. Perhaps you think you made him better, Dr. Moon. Perhaps he is nearly well. <laughs> nearly well, with his hair turned almost white. Yes, I'll go to him. I'll go to him in a minute. I'll leave me alone. Do you hear? Get out! Nearly well. It's almost over now. I can go. I'm free. Free. I'll pack my trunk. I'll get everything ready. Then I'll see John. I'll, I'll say goodbye. Oh, Luella, we were just talking. Nurse thinks it'd be a good thing for both you and me if you took me off for a ride today instead of her. Uh, no, John, I, not today. I, I don't feel up to it. Oh, but you're dressed for going out, dear. Yes, John, yes. Let me kiss you, John. Why, Luella, your, your cheek is wet. Are you, are you crying? No, no, I, I just want to say goodbye. <laughs> I'm free now. Just pick up the traveling case. Open the door. Mrs. Hample. No, no, Dr. Moon. You can't run away from yourself. I've got to go away. Out of this house of death and failure. You haven't failed. You've only begun. Let me pass. No. Go back and tell the nurse you'll take your husband for a drive. I can't. I can't. All right. All right. I'll go back, Dr. Moon. <laughs> years stand together bright and strong and the moments of tragedy are light years away pinpoints hardly visible to the naked eye I always do the best I can yet I promise nothing but it is nice to remember that I was able to help Luella Hample I'm fit again, Luella. They tell me I can go back to work tomorrow. Oh, I'm so happy, John. Oh, tomorrow after work, meet me. We'll do the town, celebrate. Oh, you've got it coming, old girl. <laughs> yes, Mary? Someone to see you, Mrs. Hempel. Oh, thank you. I'll be right back, John. Well, what about that celebration? I'll tell you in a moment, darling. <laughs> Dr. Moon. I have called to say goodbye. I'm going away for good. But you can't. I need you. No, you don't need me anymore. You don't realize it, but you've grown up. It's your turn to be the center of things. The light and glitter of the world is in your hands. Look in the mirror. Oh, new lines. New shadows that seem to be wrinkles at the corners of the eyes. Do you care? No. Do you accept the fact that your baby is dead? Yes, Dr. Moon. But all that seems so vague and, and far away. Yes, vague and far away. The household is in your keeping. If there is any light and warmth in it, it will be your light and warmth. If it is happy, it will be because you've made it so. Happy things may come to you in life, but you must never go seeking them anymore. It is your turn to make the fire. Won't you sit down a moment longer, Dr. Moon? No, there isn't time. But remember... That whatever suffering comes to you, I can always help you 
If it is something that can be helped, I promise nothing. Wait. What have you done to me? Why? Why have I no sorrow left? No sorrow left for anything at all. Tell me I must see. Yet I cannot see. Before you go, tell me who you really are. Who am I? I am the last five years. Luella, oh, there you are. I've an inspiration. Let's make it a real celebration tomorrow night. Cocktails at Moriarty's, dinner at the plaza, dancing. No, 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 darling. You're coming home to me. Oh, John, John. There's so little time. And we have so much living to do. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Once upon a time, to enter the world of magic, people said, open sesame. Nowadays, we say, RCA Victor. That golden password has long been admitting us to one new magical world of entertainment after another. In radio, in recorded music, in television. And now comes the crowning RCA Victor magic piece, a complete home entertainment unit which combines the RCA Victor best of all three worlds in one beautiful cabinet. Two radios, AM and FM, two automatic record changers to play all record speeds, and, of course, RCA Victor million-proof television, America's favorite. You'd expect these RCA Victor combinations to be labeled for millionaires only. Instead, as your RCA Victor dealer will show you, They cost far less than you'd pay for each console instrument separately. They'll revive your faith in Santa Claus. In fact, Santa Claus will be with you permanently after he delivers your RCA Victor combination, a magic piece which hands out free tickets every day to all the Shangri-Las in the world. Lula, I want to retract in part the snide remarks I made about your radio program. They were all splendid in that sketch by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Splendid. Everybody's splendid. Well, ain't that splendid? I'm going to splend a little myself. <laughs> Jimmy, what are you going to do? I'm going to act. Act? Shades of Paramore. Well, pull them down if you don't want to watch. <laughs> Still going to act. You an actor? Certainly. Didn't you see my latest picture, The Milkman? Sorry, I never get up that early. But Jimmy, what could you possibly act in? In The Adjuster, by F. Barry Fitzgerald. And I even got myself a leading lady, Emma Jean Cola. Jimmy, it's Coca. Coca, Cola, what's the difference? <laughs> Come here, Emma Jean. There's two parts in this sketch, Bankhead and Boyer. Which part do you want? Well, Bankhead, of course. You'll be Boyer. Okay, we'll do it the hard way. (laughs) Meredith, mood music if you're in the mood. My name is Dr. Moon. I'm a doctor, and I got a lot of titles to prove it. I got an R-A-G and an R-A-G-G. I got an M-O-P and an M-O-P-P. Not only that, but I'm in business with my boy. You can see our names on the door. Dr. Moon and Son. (laughs) My boy takes care of the office during the day and I take care of the office at night. That way you get the sun in the morning and the moon at night. (laughs) We're a team, my boy and me. He takes care of the office, and I go around sticking my nose into other people's affairs. And with my equipment, I do a volume business. <laughs> but I promise nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> the other day, I gets a hurry call to go over to Emma Jean Coco's house. 
I get over there and there's Coco. Nuts. <laughs> get a load of the dialogue. No, no, Dr. Moon. I do love my husband. Of course I love him. I do always love him. And I always will. And he loves me. And he's always loved me. And he always will love me. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I see, darling. But I'm drifting away from him. I always drift away from him. And I always will drift away from him. And he's drifting away from me. And he has always drifted away from me. And he always will drift away from me. Oh! <laughs> But I worry about him, and I always have worried about him, and I always will worry about him. I do nothing but worry, worry, worry. You don't know it, Mrs. Coco, but you worry too much. <laughs> I used to worry. One time I worried so much, my hair turned gray overnight, and it was laying under chiffonier. <laughs> I beg your pardon, lying under chiffonier. You lie. You always lied. You lied before, and you're lying now. You and my husband. He came into the kitchen, threw all the food out of the refrigerator. He's crazy. Threw all the food out of the refrigerator? Yes, the apples, the bananas. He ain't so crazy. You know, you're not supposed to keep bananas in the refrigerator. <laughs> I tell you, he's crazy. He's in his room now, crying and wailing. Look, I'll show you. When the love bug bites, you don't know where to scratch. He's right on the bite. You see, he's crazy. But he sold 14 million records. That's a lot of shellac. But what's so crazy about selling 14 million records? He sold them to me. What did you buy them for? I like them. I got news for you. He ain't crazy. You're the one that's crazy. Anybody that bought 14 million records has got to be crazy. And that's my advice to you. But I promise you nothing. That's the doctor. Then if I get rid of those 14 million records, I'm cured? Why don't you take them, doctor? I most certainly will not. Why not? If I do that, what am I going to do with my 14 million records? <laughs> Jimmy, Imogene, I must say you were hilarious. Thank you, Miss Bankhead. What do you mean, thank you? Mm. Everybody else is splendid. We're only hilarious. <laughs> and you, Clifton, you don't even look like we were hilarious. I'm sorry, James. I was just standing here thinking of the days of Scott Fitzgerald, when we lived life to the full, when Broadway was really Broadway, not a large papaya juice stand, <laughs> when theaters were theaters, not television studios. You remember Tallulah? We were in plays on Broadway, in the theaters, across the way from each other. Oh, of course, I was only a child. <laughs> Ma, she's not telling Shut you. up! <laughs> we meet after the theater, Tallulah, remember? The gay little restaurants we went to, the soft music and candlelight, the exotic food. I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Let's go someplace and grab an exotic sandwich. Grab a sandwich. That's the story of this era. Not like the old days, Tallulah. And the people, and those wonderful mad people. Where have they all gone? I've just seen some of them, but they're on the continent. <laughs> Living a kind of life which seems to have disappeared here. Everybody who is anybody is over there. Jimmy? Then the uh... rest <laughs> Then the restaurants over here should be pretty... <laughs> empty. <laughs> then the restaurants over here should be pretty empty. Let's go in and grab a sandwich. I'm hungry. <laughs> oh, Clever, remember the little French restaurant we used to go to? Pierre's. Of course, Pierre's. What food, what wine. Well, okay, let's go to Pierre's. What are we standing here talking about? Uh, Clifton, let's go to Pierre's. Let's try to recapture those wonderful days. I'm one step ahead of you, Tallou. I asked Kitty to meet us after the show. I saw her for one mad moment on the ski slope at Biritz. As I sped by, I yelled to her, see you at Pierre's in New York. Did you have fun over there, darling? No, oh, on the go all the time. You know how it is, the races at Ascot, roulette at Monte Carlo, swimming at Nice, skiing in the Alps, shooting in Scotland. When did you eat? <laughs> Who was there, Clifton, all the old crowd? Well, the old crowd's rather thinned out. I can see why nobody eats. <laughs> 
go to Pierce, darling. Let's try to pick life up where we dropped it in and went our separate ways. Do you think we can, Clifton? Of course. We'll go back some few years in time. After all, what is time but a figment of man's imagination? It is now half past six, figment. What's time? <laughs> Stop and let's go. Well, before you go, folks, may I say a word? No matter what you now take for headache relief, we urge you to try Anison for the incredibly fast relief these tablets bring the next time you're suffering from a headache. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take Anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison at any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. <laughs> We're off for Pierre's. Coming, Tallulah? Yes, darling. Do you remember where Pierre's was? 54th Street, wasn't it? No, no. It was uh, 45th. Oh, no, no, darling. They moved to 45th and then they moved back to 54th. Yes, but they moved back to uh, 45th Street again. Can't we go to a restaurant that's standing still? <laughs> no, I'm not only hungry, I'm dizzy. Is he coming with us? Well, of course, Clifford. Of course, Jimmy's coming along. Very well, James, but please try to look tall. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, Clifton. I must turn out the lights here. Oh, just a moment, Miss Bankhead. Before you turn out the lights, I'd like to say that this is the big show. Being brought to you by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that combines mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia and by your local Ford dealer, who is now displaying the new 1951 Ford, the car that's built for the years ahead. Now, Tallulah, would you like to ring your chimes? Thank you, Ed. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is The Big Show, and Tallulah Bankhead and Clifton Webb, trying to recapture the memory of an earlier day, have gone to a little restaurant they used to frequent years ago taking with them Jimmy Durante. Our party is now entering the little French restaurant. The proprietor greets them. Uh, bonsoir, madame, monsieur. A table for two? Just a minute. How about me? Oh, pardonnez-moi, monsieur. I did not see you. How can you see me? I ain't eaten all day. I'm the finishing American. Well, Pierre. Pierre, it's been a long time. My old friend, Pierre. Pierre, how do you do it? You haven't aged a day in all these years, has he, Clifton, darling? Looks the same as ever. Well, if Pierre looks the same as ever, it is a miracle because Pierre has been dead for 15 years. <laughs> well, Tallulah, we stayed away too long, and what a pity. There are so many old memories I wanted to talk over with Pierre. Well, tell them to me. If I don't get something to eat pretty soon, I can deliver the message in person. <laughs> I am charmed. You have a reservation, of course. We have a reservation with the past. Uh, would Monsieur care to wait until Mr. Pass arrives? No, 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 Pierre, you don't understand. Uh, Charles, madame. You have a reservation? Uh, you don't understand, Charles. We've come back after all these years to take another look at the old place we remembered so fondly. The proprietor may have changed, but the place is the same. I already have that old nostalgic feeling. You remember, darling, the expression we used to use? We used to say, Pierre is the cat's. Oh, of course, of course. A table for Mr. and Mrs. Pierre Katz. Well, would you care to check your wraps at the coat room? The young lady will take care of them. Fifi, darling. Look to Lou, it's Fifi. Still checking coats. Oh, Fifi, darling, don't you remember us? Of course, we've changed, but then so have you. You used to be tall and dark and had cold black hair. Now you're short and blonde. Mm, my name is Mindy. And darling, how quaint. You've even changed your name. <laughs> well, you don't mind if we go on calling you Fifi. You see, we're trying to get back something we lost here years ago. 
If you lost it in this cloakroom, you'll have to have a check to get it back. Well, if it were only that simple to get back what we're looking for. All I'm looking for is something to eat. <laughs> Follow me, I have a nice table with candles. Okay, I'll eat that. <laughs> Here we are. May I recommend a drink to start, perhaps? Oh, good, I'll have that. Now, the... just a moment, Tallulah. Yes, honey? Let me see if I can remember... For you, ah, yes, a very dry martini with a little onion. Oh, Clifton, you remember that. For you, darling, a martini with an olive, right? You remember, too. Hey, uh, Gendarme, make me a double. Double martini? Double olives and double onions. <laughs> I remembered I'm hungry. Oh, just a moment, Pierre. Charles. Tallulah, what are we doing ordering martinis? Don't you remember? It was always champagne to start. Oh, Clifton, you're so right, darling. Of course, champagne, Pierre. Charles, and the champagne is here. Yes, a quart of champagne. And Tallulah, your slipper, please. No, no, Clifton, now, darling, you're not going to drink it out of my slipper. I always did. It was a ritual. I insist on it. Give me your slipper. Clifton, no, darling. There. Now I have your slipper. And now a quart of champagne, and I'll drink from your... <laughs> you better make that two quarts. <laughs> I insist. Ah, here we are. I drink to you, my dear, and to the good days when life was... <laughs> oh, look at me. Champagne all over my clothes. Well, I tried to tell you, Clifton, slippers are open-toed these days. <laughs> James, will you please stop licking my suit? <laughs> One of my favorite dishes, herringbone with wine sauce. <laughs> Uh, when do we eat? Cigars, cigarettes, dolls, have your picture taken, read your fortune, tell your weight, scissors ground, chiropodist, <laughs> unemployment insurance checks cashed, Eddie Arnold buttons, and Ford motor cars. Ford motor car? That's right. All over the country, people who have seen the new Ford for 1951 are saying that it's the finest Ford ever produced. It's a car that's designed with the future in mind. For Ford engineers have actually anticipated future trends to give you a car that will stay in style, that will deliver years of satisfaction. When you see it, you'll discover this 1951 Ford offers 43 look-ahead features. Luxury lounge interiors, for example, with upholstery fabrics that blend beautifully with body colors and interior trim. Automatic ride control that adjusts the ride to the road to give you a smooth, level ride. The automatic mileage maker that enables you to enjoy maximum fuel economy. Your Ford dealer invites you to see this new quality car as soon as you can. You'll agree you can pay more, but you can't buy better than a 1951 Ford. <laughs> Who do you have to know? Who do you have to know around here to get something to eat? Hey, Pierre. Charles, monsieur. How about some frog's legs? Oh, what a divine piano. Okay, I'll take piano legs. <laughs> Who is that young man for piano? Would you ask him to come over here, please? Oh, of course. Uh, Joe, would you come over? His name is Joe Bushkin. Oh, Mr. Bushkin, I've been listening to your wonderful piano. It's just divine, darling. Thank you, Miss Bankhead, and I'm glad you dropped in tonight because I've written a song dedicated to you. To me? Oh, dear boy, but you shouldn't have. I call it Portrait of Tallulah. Oh, isn't he sweet? But you shouldn't have. Well, I think it really captures the real Tallulah. Oh, isn't he a dear? <laughs> but you really shouldn't have. Well, maybe you're right. I shouldn't have. I could change it to Portrait of Betty. <laughs> Isn't he sweet? <laughs> anyway, play it for us, won't you, Joe, darling? How do you like that? Now we're going to have dinner music without the dinner.
Oh, darling, thank you very much for that portrait of Tallulah. Clifton, isn't it wonderful that someone should write a composition for poor little old me? Come now, Tallulah. You're not poor and you're not little. <laughs> isn't he sweet? You're just jealous, darling, because no one ever wrote a portrait of Clifton. As a matter of fact, Toscanini and I are working on just such a composition. <laughs> He's writing the lyric, of course. <laughs> well, this has gone far enough. Hey, Pierre. The name is Charles. How about something to eat? Oh, of course. Uh, what would you like to start with? Food. I'll do the ordering. <laughs> Tallulah, remember the wonderful delicacies they used to serve here? What would you like? Snails? Mussels? May I recommend our specialty, monsieur? Of course, Pierre. Charles. What's the difference? Pierre, Charles. Bring on the food. I am trying to recommend something, monsieur, if you will give me but a moment. All right, Charles, go ahead. My name is Pierre. <laughs> I thought you said Pierre was dead. I'm sorry, my name is Charles, but sometimes I wish I could change places with Pierre. <laughs> what was it you were going to recommend? Well, we had the most delicious gefilte fish. <laughs> That's for me, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, wait a moment, just a moment. I thought of something. Tallulah. Yes, darling? I do remember the steaks we used to get here. Oh, yes, those tender, thick, luscious steaks. Oh, you do remember, don't you? Yes. Yes, that's what we'll have, Charles. But the good steaks, the dollar and a quarter steaks, not the 75-cent ones. Ah, <laughs> uh, monsieur, the dollar and a quarter steaks are now with Pierre. Lucky Pierre. <laughs> he may be dead, but at least he's eaten. <laughs> Dollar and quarter steaks, which you remember so well, are now six fifty. You see, the restaurant business is not what it used to be. All of a sudden, nothing seems to be like it used to be. We came here with a feeling of nostalgia. My and... stomach is feeling nostalgia. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the last time it had something to eat. But if you want nostalgia, I can give it to you. Right out of the old Club Durant, back in the thirties, when people used to eat once in a while, and everybody was singing right with me. Ink. I didn't kill you. I didn't kill you. I didn't kill you. Oh, what a two for grooming. Why you cozy? I didn't kill you. I didn't kill you. I didn't kill you. It's got the whole world spooning. You know, I went into the automat the other day. I put a lead nickel in a slot. What do you think came out? Dumb manager. It goes in. Dink a dink. Dink a doo and a dink a dink simply means it. A dink a dink, a dink a doo. Cigars, cigarettes, gardenias, theater tickets, bonbons, a prize in every package. Just hold the ring up to the light. Candy apples, have yourself paged in the main dining room. Oh, Clifford, I think I will have some cigarettes, darling. Young lady, some cigarettes, please. Yes, sir. What brand? I'll have the same as that fellow is having at the table over there. Oh, you mean Bing Crosby. Bing, did you see that postcard we got from Bob Holt, the one from Alaska? Say, you know, I don't think fat boy ought to spend too much time up there in the Eskimo country. You know how crazy they are about blubber. <laughs> Say, what, what was the postcard? Give me the vine on there. What well, uh, didn't you notice the postmark? No. It postmarked the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Could this Alaska Valley have anything to do with the fact that over 10,000 smokers make the Chesterfield mildest test every day? Well, I don't see how, Bing. You see the 10,000 Smokes up there from Alaskan volcanoes. Well, I'm sure Bob fixed it so all those craters are now smoking those good, milder Chesterfield. Friends, you can prove it to yourself that Chesterfield is the milder cigarette. Just open them, smell them, and smoke them. Chesterfield, Chesterfield always wins first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. This Christmas, give Chesterfield Christmas cartons with Bing Crosby as Papa Santa Claus. <laughs> Darling, you were such a wonderful dancer. Let's dance now, shall we, darling? Yes. We always used to dance here, didn't we, Tallulah? Maybe this will bring back some of the wonderful memories. It's just like old times dancing with you. I fit right here. One arm around my shoulder, one arm around my waist. 
The other arm around... Jimmy, what are you doing between Clifton and me? I'm dancing. <laughs> I ain't eating, so I'm dancing. <laughs> Which one of you two is going to dance with me? Or, I'm no snob, let's make it a threesome. Jimmy, will you please go back to the table and get yourself something to eat, darling? Clifton and I are trying to recapture a mood. Tallulah, I'm afraid we'll never be able to recapture it. Oh, we must, darling. We must, we must, we must. Tallulah, you're crying. Please, I can't stand tears. Well, you're standing on my foot. <laughs> I'm sorry. You see, we don't even dance well together anymore. Oh, keep dancing, darling. We're doing fine. Tallulah... Do you remember in the old days the way you used to sing along with the orchestra while we danced? Why don't you sing again now? Oh, Clifton, darling, it's sweet of you to ask me, but I couldn't, really, I couldn't. Please, Tallulah, for me? Well? For old time's sake, Tallulah? For old time's sake, darling. Thank you, darling. I'll be singing in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through in that small cafe the park across the way the children's carousel the chestnut trees, the wishing well, Clifton, darling. I'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day, in everything that's bright and gay. I'll always think of you that way. Find you in the morning sun. And when the night is new, I'll be looking at the moon. But I'll be seeing you. It's been a lovely, lovely evening, Clifton, but I'm afraid we just can't rekindle old memories. You're right, Tallulah. Well, good night, Pierre. I mean, Charles. Oh, that's quite all right, monsieur. What's the difference if you call me Pierre or Charles or even my real name, Maya? <laughs> <laughs> what difference would you name your past? There will always be a past. And 20 years from now, you will be as nostalgic about this evening as you are now about the evenings you spent with Pierre or Sam, which was his real name. Very well put, Sam. No, please, it's Maya. <laughs> so that's an idea, darling. We'll make a date to meet right here 20 years from now. Very well, but please phone me the day before and remind me. Uh, how about you, Jimmy, darling? Will you meet us here, too? I won't have to meet you. I'll be here still waiting for something to eat. <laughs> well, Tallulah, until then... Good night. Darling, a good night kiss? Oh, I hate these sad partings. But if you must kiss me, on the brow, please. <laughs> Ma, she missed the brow by five inches. <laughs> Well, darlings, we've come to the end of another big show. Next week, we come to you from Hollywood. And what a cast. Louis Armstrong, Bob Hope, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Frankie Lane, and as always, Meredith Wilson and the big show orchestra and chorus. And beginning next week, an exciting new first in radio. The Actors' Company of Hollywood joins the big show as a weekly feature. This outstanding theater group Numbering among its members some of the movie's capital's finest creative talents will bring you each week an exciting, dramatic sketch especially adapted for the actor's company. I'm particularly pleased to welcome the actor's company to the big show, inasmuch as we appreciate stars who take an active interest in the living theater. I'm looking forward to a pleasant and rewarding association. 
Next week, for its premiere on the big show, the Actors' Company will present Rosalind Russell and Dorothy McGuire in The Women. And now, the rest of the company joins me in hoping that until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you whether near or far away. Mindy? May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Imogene? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortunes ten times ten. Jimmy? May the good Lord Bless and keep you till we meet again, Eddie. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. Clifton? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Joe? May you walk with sunlight shining and the bluebird in every tree. May there be a silver lining Back of every cloud you see Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been May the good Lord bless and keep you Until we meet again. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet till we Good night, darlings. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, has been brought to you by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that combines mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By the makers of Addison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by your local Ford dealer, who is now displaying the new 1951 Ford, the car that's built for the years ahead. Listen to The Big Show next Sunday, when we will come to you from Hollywood. And we'll have with us Louis Armstrong, Bob Hope, Frankie Lane, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, 
and the Actors Company with Rosalind Russell and Dorothy McGuire and Meredith Wilson and the orchestra and chorus and, of course, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. The Big Show is directed and produced by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman Ace with George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. Bill Harris and Alice Bay next on NBC. NBC.